All right. We're on. Uh, all right. Well, thanks uh, everyone so much for coming uh, to join us today. Um, we're really excited to have uh, Seth Baum here from the uh, Global Catastrophic Risk Institute um, talking um, about AI governance, which is um, currently their main focus there. Um, so Seth's the executive director um, of the Institute, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank working on the risk uh, of events that could significantly harm or destroy uh, human civilization at the global scale. Um, and he's also a research affiliate at the C Center for the Study of Existential Risk at, uh, at the University of Cambridge. Um, and yeah, we're really excited to hear from him tonight. Um, thank you so much, Seth. Take it away. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Good to have the chance to speak with all of you. And I'm um, sorry, it, it couldn't work out in person. I, I wouldn't have been able to make the, the trip in any way, but um, uh, no worries. We can still at least have a, a, a good conversation like this. The, the, the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute, we were actually uh, created from the start as a, a organization based on remote collaboration. This is, this is actually normal for us. The, how, how the rest of the world's been uh, operating during the pandemic is pretty much how we've been. Um, uh, functioning all along, and that's because of um, a, a lot of what we do is uh, bring together people from uh, really around the world who work on these risks to collaborate and, and advance the, the study and, and, and action of the topic we tend to take. Uh, so we identify as a think tank, which means that we are uh, we, we kind of situate ourselves at the intersection of the world of scholarship and the world of professional practice. So to do work on a topic like AI governance, this is thinking, what are the practical governance steps that can be taken to reduce global catastrophic risks from, from uh, artificial intelligence? And we'll get into to some detail on that uh, throughout the talk. Um, first, just to confirm before I go off too far in the wrong direction, my plan is to speak for about 30 minutes, give or take, and then we'll have uh, uh, time for discussion and, and questions afterwards. Is that, does that sound about right? Yeah, okay. I uh, don't wanna ramble on for too long. I could, I could certainly talk uh, all night about this, but I'll go ahead. And uh, I will also try to share some slides that I made for uh, the talk. And so if I do this and this, you guys should be able to um, uh, see my slides. Those should look good. Okay, so uh, then I'll go ahead and dive into it. This uh, first slide here, uh, looking at power versus time, this is you know, a, a large portion of the, the whole idea right here. If you can understand the slide, then it's not that you understand that every detail of the whole idea, but this you know, big picture is what we're looking at. So right now, AI already is uh, very um, uh, capable, powerful, whatever word you wanna use, uh, you know, deep learning and, and related technologies, of course, have a very substantial impact around the world already. And this has motivated a lot of uh, interest in AI over the last five or so years, give or take. Um, and then uh, a lot of the discussion about AI and global catastrophic risk is focused on AI that we might call high power, uh, which is essentially AI that's able to take over the world. Um, and this is where the risk comes from. It has control over the world and the outcome depends uh, essentially on how it's been designed, what it uses with, with this capability. And perhaps unless it's designed quite carefully, it would end up destroying us and everything else that we care about, which would certainly classify as a global catastrophe. There may also be an intermediate uh, uh, degree of power, a type of AI that is significantly more capable than the sort of deep learning technology that we have right now, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's not so powerful that it would uh, take over the world from humans. And there's a lot of uncertainty about all of this, what the future technology might look like, um, when these sorts of transitions may occur, and certainly the implications of them. But from our perspective as, as risk analysts, the possibility of uh, catastrophe from these um, uh, further into the future high power uh, uh, AI scenarios 
are uh, certainly enough of a risk to, to merit some attention, uh, even at this, uh, at this point in time. It's worth noting that there are scenarios in which either the, the low power or medium power AI could uh, affect global catastrophic risk. In fact, AI already does affect global catastrophic risk in various ways. Uh, this occurs mainly when AI <clears throat> is connected to other types of global catastrophic risk. So the simple example is uh, AI technology already consumes significant amounts of electricity. That electricity often, not always, but often comes from fossil fuels and that contributes to climate change. And so that's one way that AI affects global catastrophic risk already. And it can even be quite quite substantial. Um, and the, the prospects for those sorts of scenarios will continue to become larger even uh, uh, before, uh, as the technology advances, even before it gets to this uh, high power stage. Most of what I'm going to be discussing with you is oriented toward this uh, high power uh, future AI. Uh, you'll hear words like artificial general intelligence or super intelligence. Uh, a, a new term that gets used is prepotent AI as rough synonyms for high power AI. Um, that there are important distinctions between these different terms, but we can we can gloss over that for our purposes. And having some emphasis on these uh, high high power scenarios, this is not to say that uh, the low power and medium power AI is not important. It just happens to be a uh, a primary focus for the work that we've been doing at at GCRI and and um, certainly other groups within the effective altruism space have also. Uh, put a lot of effort into these high power AI scenarios with with good reason. Um, but this doesn't mean that the the low power and medium power scenarios aren't aren't also important. Um, <clears throat> and so just to to walk through the the middle section of bullet points, it's possible that we will not get any further than low power. Perhaps we won't be able to build anything more advanced than what we have now, or maybe there'll be some sort of catastrophe related to or unrelated to AI before we get the chance to build anything more advanced. Likewise, if we get to a medium degree of power, it may plateau there, uh, or it could go from medium power on up to high power, or it's even possible that we would get to high power AI with a jump directly from low power to uh, high power AI, in particular, if, um, if the uh, AI that we have right now is actually uh, pretty um, pretty relevant for getting all the way to something that could be high power. If you can basically extend what we already have and get to a um, fairly advanced high power AI. The best guess is probably that we need something in between, but this is a big point of uncertainty. And uh, actually switching over to the next slide, this, um, this speaks to the paradigms a little bit more. So deep learning, is at the core of cutting edge artificial intelligence technology right now. Um, it's possible that um, as, uh, uh, as time goes on, you can just scale deep learning up to get to a medium degree of power and, and a high degree of power. Or it's also possible that you would need something else, perhaps on its own or perhaps in combination with something like deep learning. Um, and that this is this is actually a big active debate in the the computer science of uh, forecasting future AI. This is less my my own particular expertise on it, but for anybody who's interested, this uh, uh, Creamer 2021 paper. This is um, out of the uh, Oxford Future of Humanity Institute. Really good paper looking at uh, various details of um, the thinking about can deep learning scale to, to much higher degrees of power or do we need very different paradigms? And um, also the, the Gary Marcus and, and Ernest Davis book is, is excellent. They're at, uh, the two of them are actually at uh, NYU, so you might even be able to get them to, to speak with you sometime uh, if you're interested in getting uh, more detail. That's a fabulous book that they wrote, just has a, a great overview of the past present and future of AI technology. And they argue that deep learning is going to face um, major limitations, that it's just not going to get you very far, uh, and that you're going to need other paradigms for things like common sense, because deep learning is rooted in like statistical analysis. Um, that's why the, the big data sets.
access to um, huge amounts of computing power is so relevant for deep learning because it's basically just doing a, a massive uh, statistical pattern recognition across these, these big data sets. And uh, they think that that's going to face some, some fundamental limitations because they're things like common sense that just don't, don't readily fit into uh, what deep learning as a, a type of algorithm is, is suited for doing. Uh, okay, so uh, this slide here on the distribution of power and rate of change, this is specifically for high power AI. Uh, this right here points to a pretty large portion of the active uh, uh, debate, active conversation about what we should expect and maybe also what we should want for um, uh, uh, high power AI scenarios. And there's um, been, I would say, a, a shift in recent years from an emphasis on scenarios in which there is a single AI system that very abruptly, very rapidly just takes over the world, the quote unquote fast takeoff uh, scenarios um, that has been a, a primary point of emphasis for, for many years. More recently, there has been a much greater emphasis on scenarios in which a transition to a, a high power AI uh, occurs much more gradually and also um, is much more distributed. It's less about one AI system that takes over the world and more about um, kind of the, the overall AI sector that, that takes over the world. And the difference between those two scenarios, even just right there, uh, has really profound governance implications. So uh, for comparison, the, the scenario in which you have one AI system that effectively takes over the world, this is something that is a, a good way to think about this would be um, like analogous to the uh, very high security uh, uh, bio, uh, bio research labs, which everybody knows about now, because for example, the, the uh, research lab in, in Wuhan in China that has been the center of all this controversy surrounding the, the origins of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I have no special insight on whether the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology had anything to do with this pandemic. Uh, I, I know basically the same, uh, just as much as anybody else does, just from reading the news about that. But um, regardless of whether that particular lab had anything to do with the pandemic, it still is the case that these labs do have the potential to um, have, <clears throat> excuse me, accidents or even uh, intentional release of pathogens and that could result in very severe pandemics. It's why the labs have such um, uh, rigid security measures in place in the first place to prevent that sort of thing from happening. Uh, and you know, there's, there's labs all over the world, certainly including in the United States that, that have similar sort of um, uh, uh, security uh, security risk there. <clears throat> That's kind of the, the basic mental model, uh, a basic concept for how to think about these single AI system fast takeoff scenarios. That is basically, there's one AI lab somewhere and anywhere in the world, it does something wrong, the AI gets out and it's everywhere and there's not really anything that we can do about it. And so the whole point is to make sure that that lab does not make any mistakes like that in its, its development. And not just that lab, but every lab that might ever be developing that sort of system. And so you want a governance regime that's broadly similar to the governance of the um, uh, high stakes uh, biological pathogens. So in contrast, scenarios in which you have a gradual transition from a large distributed network of AI systems, this is much more similar to like governing the overall economy. Um, and so the challenge here is to not so much avoid mistakes from any one group, but to make sure that the overall AI sector, the overall AI industry, if you will, is oriented 
in a uh, in a good direction. Um, and so the uh, this is actually, I would say, more analogous to say governing the energy industry while being mindful of global warming. So the fossil fuel industry is really at the heart of uh, global warming. And we could say that perhaps the uh, energy sector as a whole and the fossil fuel uh, uh, portion of that in particular has drifted off in a way that runs counter to the overall best interests of, of human civilization. And this is why we're struggling to deal with, with global warming these days. And so the governance challenge there is to have is to try and get the entire energy sector, which includes a whole bunch of different companies doing a whole bunch of different things that uh, show up across uh, you know, a, a million and one different things uh, across the economy. Like, what, it, <clears throat> what do we do that involves energy? Well, just about everything. And so what do we do that involves AI? Maybe not quite as much as what we do that involves energy, but it's still very widely dispersed. Uh, across the the entire economy, and so perhaps the governance challenge will be ensuring that the overall AI industry is proceeding in a direction that uh, is consistent with uh, the best interest of human civilization or whatever it is, else it is that we're trying to to orient AI to. Um, and that's um, so that right there is a big a big point of discussion. I think that covers couple of the uh, the items within this uh, this table here certainly the single system dominates single AI system dominates and it's abrupt that's the standard uncontrolled fast takeoff scenario that's the the one the traditional one that's kind of like the biosecurity and then the power distributed across many AI systems that's gradual the standard uncontrolled slow takeoff that's the one that's getting uh, a lot more recent attention that's more similar to governing the, the energy industry. Um, there are other scenarios. Uh, won't go through all of them, but a, a big point that is worth talking about a little bit more is the difference between the scenarios in which uh, the AI systems uh, are in control versus the systems in which control is uh, retained within humans. So. This is a primary focus within work on uh, the ethics and safety of, of AI technology, especially for the, the high, power, um, uh, high power AI work. If you hear of people, including people in the effective altruism space, talking about AI safety, value alignment, uh, uh, things of that sort, they are generally talking about how to design AI technology such that humans can remain in control even as the AI technology gets a really high degree, to, degree of power such that without this special design uh, built into it, that the AI potentially could take over the world, but humans are going to remain in control anyway because we designed it in that way. That's... Um, that's the the overall emphasis of the, the AI safety and value alignment and, and things of that sort of work that is done. My read of the work is that it's in need of a, a broader conversation about the extent to which that really is the direction that we want to be uh, orienting things. Um, and I, I should uh, put in a caveat here is that this is a research in progress on, on our end at, at GCRI. And so uh, what I'm conveying to you now is our current impressions, our, our current understanding of the, um, excuse me, the, the uh, state of affairs within the AI safety value alignment and so on. I think these ideas check out, but uh, I did just want to put that caveat in there um, just to um, be clear that we should keep an open mind about all of this. Uh, and I'm gonna, let me uh, say a bit more about that. Look at um, uh, uh, two, two specific aspects of this. So first, um, there's a, a quote from a, a paper that, that we published earlier this year. You can see the, the reference down at the bottom, the uh, moral consideration of non-humans. 
in the ethics of AI, uh, quote being uh, that the concept of human compatible AI developed by Russell is in reference to uh, Stuart Russell leads the, the group CHI, the uh, Center for Human Compatible AI that's based at, at UC Berkeley. And uh, uh, him and his, his colleagues there have been, have been among those who have done a lot of really good work on, on this uh, topic. But uh, as Russell put it, specifically for AI, whose only objective is to maximize the realization of human preferences. Uh, and uh, noting this is an effective altruism group for any of you in the audience who happen to have background in animal welfare, uh, this may raise uh, some, some flags for you that this is uh, a statement of, of ethics that is uh, very focused on humans. Now, because it's human preferences, that can include things like human preferences for advancing animal welfare and things of that sort. Um, but we're now counting on whatever humans are going to be aligned to this AI to have adequate values with respect to things like animal welfare. And we are not making any attempt to do things like account for the preferences of the, the non-human animals. And this is the um, sort of point that we make in, in the, the research papers that we need to have a better accounting or we, we, we may want to have a better accounting for uh, non-humans in AI ethics because the concern is that if we do build very powerful AI systems that are, uh, who, whose ethics are, are designed in this sort of fashion, then we could uh, end up with, so in the worst case, we could end up with results that are just flatly catastrophic for non-human animals and, and anything else that's not specifically human. Uh, and even if it's not catastrophic for them, we may still be, I would say, leaving a lot of value on the table in a sense that we could, even if we still end up with good outcomes as opposed to catastrophically bad outcomes, perhaps we could end up with much better outcomes if we were to design AI in a way that was not so uh, human-centric. And it's been very interesting for me working on this because you know, I, I care about animal welfare quite a lot myself. I uh, you know, maintain something in the vicinity of a vegan diet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I am surprised that there has not been more work in this direction on uh, AI ethics that's not so human-centric, because I would think that there would be a lot of people out there who care about AI and you know, catastrophic risk in the future and all of that stuff who also care about animal welfare and things like that. So I'm surprised that the what we've seen in AI AI ethics has been so human centric. I feel odd that like I'm the one who's taking this on because I got other things that I could be doing instead of this. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm happy to take this on and, and you know, stand up for less um, human-centric approaches in, in AI ethics. And, and you know, the, the rest of the team at, at GCRI is, is happy to be doing this also. Um, I, I bring this up in case um, any of you in the audience may, may catch an interest in, in this sort of topic. Uh, there's definitely room for more to be done on this. And I do want to acknowledge uh, there's one other group, the Sentience Institute has also uh, started working on this direction, uh, working on this, uh, this sort of topic. And so it's, it's not just us. Um, my impression is that the people who are uh, more focused on the value alignment and all of that may often ultimately favor outcomes that are not so human centric and that they may have other maybe even unspoken ideas for how to get there um, but this seems like something that really needs to kind of rise to the surface and, and be more of a, a, an active conversation. Uh, one uh, point that goes even beyond this, I'm uh, uh, quoting here from recent paper uh, that looks at a range of different uh, future AI scenarios. Um, and, uh, how can one 
build a, a single uh, AI system to serve uh, the goals and interests of a single human. Uh, uh, numerous authors have considered this uh, under the name of alignment. Uh, my understanding is that this line here is actually correct, that a lot of the work that's being done, uh, including by a lot of people within the effective altruism space on uh, value alignment is actually oriented toward aligning the values of one single human being to a high power AI system, which I think the the reasoning behind that is that just getting it aligned to one person is is already a very difficult challenge, and that's maybe an appropriate starting point, and that we're going to want to also find ways to do more than just one person. I think that might be the idea. I'm not certain about this, but this does seem like something that's uh, that's screaming for for a conversation because you know this just raises the question. If we're building a high power AI system that's going to take over the world and we're aligning it to one person, we're essentially saying that this one person is going to take over the world. It's like, who's going to be that person? Um, and like, why do we think that, I mean, maybe if that's our, our only option, better than having to destroy everything. But uh, it, this seems like something that uh, needs to be uh, uh, it needs to be explored a little bit uh, more, and there, there needs to be a, a, a stronger conversation on this. I think part of it might just be that a lot of the people working on this have more of a, a computer science background and less of an ethics and governance background. That might be part of it. Um, but I don't know. I, I've been trying to wrap my mind around this for for a while, and and it's hard for me to avoid conclusions like this that all this work is going to happen like one person basically take over the world which seems um uh, uh, a, a nervous prospect shall we shall we say whoops what did i just do okay um all right so maybe i will i will end on uh, uh this slide here i have more slides to go into this in, in a lot more detail but this is probably a good a good place to um, uh, to end on, and so this is okay, fine. So, what all do we? What exactly can any of us do about any of these things? Uh, and the answer is that there's a lot that a lot of different people can do. Uh, the slide here is specifically phrased in terms of future AI governance, um, where the idea here is that. As AI technology becomes increasingly powerful, if and when it ever does, then uh, how the technology is governed, how it's how it's designed, how the groups that design it are, uh, uh, who who oversees that, and, and what they what direction they orient those groups in, uh, this applies for whether we're looking at a single. AI group that might produce a, a single system that takes over the world, or alternatively for um, a, uh, a more decentralized sort of scenario, uh, how will uh, humans govern the development of, of AI technology in the future? Um, and it's, um, so there are a lot of, let me see, do I have, yeah, let me skip over to this next slide here. The, the previous slide has some more more uh, general considerations. But on, on this side here, what can we do? So one, improve current AI governance. Uh, so for example, in, in public policy, AI is, is a hot topic in public policy right now. There's a lot of work being done to set up policy regimes for AI. It's quite possible that uh, some portion of these regimes will end up proving fairly durable such that policy design decisions that are being made right now could uh, carry on into uh, fairly far into the future. And so this creates a reason for us to try to influence this uh, current AI governance, not just for uh, uh, the benefits that it brings to AI technology that exists right now, and that's totally worthy thing to engage on in its own right, but also for how it can then set things up for uh, a future AI governance. 
Uh, the second one, supporting AI governance communities, uh, such as uh, people within the effective altruism space that work on this. Uh, communities have the, certainly have the potential to uh, be fairly durable, but not just durable, also flexible. So I think like a research community has an intellectual tradition that can carry on over the years or decades or even centuries in some cases, but the particulars of those ideas can evolve and uh, mature and refine over the years as, as further research is being done. Uh, so too with policymaking communities and and so on and so forth. And so supporting communities, letting these communities grow is another great way to set things up for the future. Um, uh, a third, advancing research. There is just uh, so much uncertainty, so many ideas that haven't really been explored, uh, points that haven't really been followed up on. We talked about a few of them uh, regarding the, the AI ethics. Uh, just a, a few slides ago, those are great examples of topics that uh, would really benefit from additional research attention. But there is this is a really wide open space. It's not like, say, climate change, where climate change as a research topic has gotten you know, decades of uh, very extensive, very interdisciplinary research attention. And still, there's plenty more research to be done on climate change, but at least with climate change governance, they have a very rich interdisciplinary body of research that they can draw on for AI that just does not exist at this time. Uh, there's um, there's so much that hasn't been done yet. Advancing the computer science, uh, item four, advancing the computer science of how to design AI safely and, and ethically is also very important. Uh, you can't have safe and ethical AI without designs for how to do it. Um, and uh, you also need the governance to make sure the AI ideas for how to do things safely and ethically are actually used in the AI systems that get built. But the more progress there is on the computer science of this, the easier the governance challenges become. Because you can imagine like a, a government thinking, you know, I'd be happy to adopt a high degree of safety standards if those safety standards are already out there and I don't have to develop them myself because I don't have the time or the resources to develop these these safety techniques myself. But somebody if somebody else has already done it, yeah, we, maybe we'd be happy to do that. That's, that's the idea there. Uh, and then finally, improving underlying governance conditions. So this uh, involves just overall how well is uh, civilization governs, how good is public policy, uh, how well do rival countries get along with each other, how well does the private sector, uh, uh, corporations, how well is their work uh, aligned with the, the public interest as opposed to just um, you know, their own uh, financial interest as, as a firm, uh, as things of that sort, these very general kind of big picture uh, governance conditions are relevant for a really wide range of issues, certainly not just AI, but they, they definitely are relevant for um, uh, AI as well. So for example, in AI, uh, the relationship between the United States and China could be very important, noting that the US and China are probably the, the two leading countries on, on AI development. And the more the two countries get along with each other, the easier it will be for them to cooperate on uh, high standards for, for safety and, and ethics for AI versus if, um, if they don't get along with each other, then you could see more adversarial scenarios and that could be a, um, uh, a significant problem. So uh, that's, that's one more example. I could go on in detail about any of these things, but perhaps this is a good stopping point and I'd be happy to uh, uh, elaborate on any of these or, or field other questions um, as, as people have them. Uh, awesome, thank you so much, Seth. That was like super, super interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel like I have a much better understanding of this whole um, area now. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, um, and I have some questions myself that I'll throw in as we um, start answering these. But um, yeah, uh, so we can start with um, 
Sam's question. Um, uh, so uh, Sam uh, said that his um, intuition about the kind of AI ethics um, focus on uh, like lack of focus on animal welfare um, is that uh, developers of AI systems will be heavily constrained by human preferences generally. And so it seems like the best way to um, incorporate animal welfare might be to just create more general popular pressure um, um, in favor of animal welfare. Um, and yeah, have, does that seem uh, like it might be accurate or do you kind of see another way to work on this? I would say it's, <clears throat> I, I would say there is something to this, um, but they might not be as heavily constrained as the uh, the question may suggest. Uh, so first of all, I, I, the the easy answer is that this is an open question. This is, a, this is not something that the uh, the answer can be uh, provided with with any degree of precision. Um, <clears throat> and I would add that this uh, project of um, promoting much broader uh, interest in animal welfare and, and things of that sort across society and, and so on, uh, this actually fits uh, very precisely within that very last bullet point that we were talking to about improving general across the board societal conditions. I had mentioned relations between the US and China. That's one example. Um, overall societal concern about animal welfare, that's another example right there. And I would certainly agree with the basic idea being that if we find ourselves living in a world that has just much more across the board support for animal welfare, uh, that is that makes it more likely that that sort of thing is going to also carry over into AI development. And so um, there is a sense in which you know this is uh, uh, these different lines of work are, are all you know helping in the same direction. These are, are synergistic activities. Um, that said, uh, and I'm a, uh, just thinking off the top of my head a little bit here, uh, but my, my immediate reaction to that is that there is a role for both, that those who are more immediately within the, um, the AI space do in fact have a significant uh, degree of freedom to pursue these sorts of things as they see fit. And that a lot of this is not specifically dictated by what happens across the rest of society. Um, uh, probably the, the clearest case in point is that uh, my understanding uh, from having studied AI ethics uh, in, in terms of its attention to non-humans generally, and also uh, a little bit on the moral psychology of how much humans will care about non-humans, is that the general population actually cares more about non-humans than what you see within the AI ethics space. Now, it may be that, and I actually think this is true, that people in AI ethics care about non-humans more than one might think, given the nature of the work that they've been doing. Um, and I say this because from my own uh, work trying to push attention to non-humans in AI ethics, it's been getting a fairly positive response. Nobody's like actively disagreeing with the, the points that we're making. I think most of them probably, fingers crossed, agree that we should also care about non-humans and they just haven't been doing it in their work yet. And so these are people who you don't even need to persuade, you just need to get them to do a little bit more of things that they do in fact already agree with. Um, and so I see a lot of value to working within the AI ethics space to one, uh, get them up to at least the same standard that the rest of society has in terms of caring about non-humans. And two, I think even pushing beyond that, noting that there is, a, I think, a, a pretty compelling case to push beyond the, the current state of, of caring about uh, non-humans across society. And I think a lot of people in AI ethics 
would support that and then can uh, use what freedom they do have uh, to take positive actions in that sort of direction. Uh, but this is all to say, keep trying to convince the rest of the world to, to care about animal welfare and non-humans and all that stuff. That's, that's still great work to be doing. Um, yeah, this kind of ties into one of the questions I had is like when you were mentioning um, just uh, that there's a, like a lot of uh, technical AI safety researchers just don't have like much of a background in ethics. Um, it seems like I think most people that are thinking about AI safety and like want to work on this um, and don't have technical uh, research skills like often go into like a policy route because that seems to be like the other option but it it seems like, um, and maybe this is just like what you guys are actually doing. It seems like there's like a space uh, generally for like more philosophers, like working directly at like organizations like OpenAI or something. Um, mm -hmm. so does that seem useful or? Yeah, what? so there, there's, it's certainly true that um, there has been a significant influx of, of people going into the AI policy space over the last few years. And um, part of it's just because a few years ago, there wasn't really much of an AI policy space to, to go into, uh, and, and now there is, and, and there definitely are people going into that. I do think that's a, a great, uh, a, a great uh, area to go into. I will add to that one uh, related sort of area that I feel like has probably not been getting the same degree of attention within the effective altruism space is on corporate governance. Uh, now there is overlap between public policy and corporate governance. Uh, uh, public policy can be used to contribute to how corporations are governed, but there's also a lot of important work to be done both within the corporation itself and from the outside, uh, public media, NGOs, et cetera. Um, and I've seen more emphasis on public policy and what governments do than on what corporations do. And I would encourage people to consider also looking at the corporate governance space. Now to your question. Um, so uh, let's see here is the question that perhaps there has been a shortage of people who are working in like independent nonprofits like GCRI or, or, or other groups or, or even within OpenAI, you mentioned within the, the AI groups themselves to try and push these issues. Um, and that, that may be a reason why there hasn't been more in this direction. Maybe it's certainly true that if you work in a government position you are more constrained in terms of the sorts of ideas that you can push for. Uh, those of us who, who work uh, uh, outside of government have a much higher degree of freedom in terms of the sorts of ideas that, that we can promote. And that's just because when you work for the government, you are, you know, you're, you're part of the government. What you do reflects on like the official position of, of that particular government. And uh, there's a lot at stake with that and the, uh, the constraints there are a lot more. Um, maybe, but there still is a, a sizable number of people who work outside of government um, on these sorts of topics. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm surprised. I'm I'm surprised that there hasn't been more on this. But I guess that to some extent, I I don't know the answer. Yeah, um, and thanks for bringing more attention to that with your work. Um, yeah, just uh, there's another question about um, sort of like, yeah, uh, if people, if, if, if it's true that as you're saying, um, like the general population does care about non-human welfare, uh, then uh, would that, why wouldn't that show up in an AI that values like human preferences? Because that seems like sort of a catch-all. I think uh, as you were saying, it might just be, because it's like focused on one one human's preferences. Yeah, it just it, it puts a lot of state look a lot of uh, uh, a lot ends up depending on what those particular preferences end up being. Um, so and and it's it's not hard to imagine there being better ways of handling it. So I will say one idea that is out there that that. Um, 
does have a certain appeal is the idea that the first thing we should do is just make that transition into a world that has really powerful AI systems and um, have it not destroy us and maybe also have it help um, addressing other global catastrophic risks, uh, but with a relatively light touch on things and then use that to buy us time to figure out what to do with it. Um, the uh, a, a term that has been used in this context is the, the long reflection. Um, I think uh, Toby Ord in his, his new book talked about this. Uh, I, I think that's, that's in there. Um, the, the long reflection, it's this idea that before we go off and do much more ambitious uh, moral projects, potentially including like uh, expanding into outer space and uh, or big things like that, that let's uh, pause and think through exactly what we want to be doing. Um, and that the focus should right now should not be on thinking through what we actually want to be doing. The focus now should be on buying us more time to think things through. And that's totally plausible. I, I, I totally get that idea um, that perhaps um, we we should just try to buy ourselves some time and, and that some of these questions may, uh, uh, may not need to be pursued uh, at this time. But I would say these questions may not need to be pursued, but they may also need to be pursued, that we may not have the, the luxury of uh, uh, a long reflection period, that things could end up being fairly uh, sensitive to how the initial AI systems are designed. That's also a very plausible set of scenarios. Um, and that even if we are having uh, this, this reflection period, there needs to be a lot of care in how that ends up being designed because again the outcomes could be fairly sensitive to to how it is is designed and um at any rate all of this whether it's a, a reflection period or, or things being um you know sensitive to how things are designed initially all of this is what we need to be really talking about um because a lot of it a lot of the um the outcomes could could come down to this Um, yeah, sorry, I have lots of questions about that and then I want to get to more of the audience questions, but like, um, uh, yeah, you kind of, when you were talking earlier about like managing AI as being like more similar to managing like the energy system and thinking about like global warming rather than managing like specific smaller, uh, like bio labs, um, and managing the security there. Um, it seems like I, I can understand that there's like a lot more activity happening um, within the AI space, which makes it more similar um, to that. But uh, it still seems like the like there is this higher risk of like a single bad actor um, with AI. That's like less true of something uh, than like fossil fuel companies, where um, it's just like an overall economic system and like it, it's. They have like uh, they don't have the right incentives, but they're unlikely to just like extract a bunch of oil and like set it on fire just to. Sorry, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah um, trailing off, but um, yeah, it, it seems like the long reflection also. Uh, uh, it seems like that could be not happen if like there's like a single bad AI system or bad actor that like kind of derails that. Uh, so first of all, yes, if there, if we are looking at scenarios in which a single AI could take over the world, and if that single AI system is uh, designed poorly such that it would, um, in this case, uh, not be um, uh, set up to, to facilitate this long reflection period, then we wouldn't get it. Um, and uh, as far as the difference between 
like, is it a single system versus is it a wider mix of systems? Um, this gets into different conceptions about what the AI technology itself is going to look like. Um, it, so for, for comparison, what we have right now with deep learning is fairly distributed. Like with the one AI system takes over the world, there's lots of talk of like, who's going to, you know, win the race, quote unquote, it's not much of a winning if everybody's destroyed, but maybe there could be a race to be the first one to build it because whoever builds it first gets to define the, the outcome for, for everything. Um, it doesn't make sense to talk about a race to be the first to build deep learning. That's just, it doesn't work like that. There has been, uh, there have been different groups that have pushed the cutting edge of deep learning in various ways. And, and you know, that continues to happen on an ongoing basis that, you know, now this group over here has the most advanced deep learning system, or at least for this this particular application of deep learning, but it's distributed. Deep learning is all over the place. Um, there is no one group that, that won the, the deep learning race. It's just, it just doesn't work that way. Um, and perhaps that will continue to be the case, in which case one implication of that is if there is one bad actor, then there's limits to how much harm they can do. Because uh, just like with the energy sector, say you get one person who decides that they want to, you know, uh, set fire to some oil field. That's terrible, but it's only terrible to a limited extent. It doesn't completely destroy the entire energy sector. It just causes one sizable, you know, very significant headache in that that one location. It has some global implications, but it's not the whole thing. Um, and so, likewise, if AI does continue to be developed in this sort of decentralized fashion, which may be because the nature of the AI technology is such that you can push more advanced programs for more advanced specific applications. Maybe this would become the, the leading system for this application, that for that application, and so on and so forth, which is roughly what you have right now. Um, then there may be limits to how, how much harm any one bad actor could, could cause, uh, which maybe is a good thing, but the downside to it is then uh, you have to govern the entire aggregate of the, the entire sector, which is, you know, as we know from trying to govern the, the energy sector, is that's, that's also not, not very easy. Thanks, Seth. Um, okay, so there's uh, two questions that I think were sort of related, so I'll just uh, read them up together. Um, so um, Sam was asking about, uh, he asked, which alignment agendas do you see is specifically oriented towards the single human case? Um, and he says most of what he's seen seems pretty indifferent as to whether the preferences come for a single human, an aggregate or average of humans or a political institution. Um, and um, Chine mentions that he uh, finished um, Russell's book yesterday, which um, seemed to land on preference, preference utilitarianism as a plausible approach um, to serving society as opposed to single humans. China might not have explained yeah. correctly if you want to jump in and uh, clarify. Yeah. Um, I, I so first of all, my, my understanding is that that is a, a correct read of, of Russell's book. Um, I, uh, my recollection of the book, I haven't looked at it recently, but my recollection of the, the book is that it also has a certain emphasis on uh, assessing preferences by observing behaviors, which is an approach that raises some uh, raises some concerns that um, are quite familiar within the the, um, the field of welfare economics. Um, you know, this dates to work by like Amartya Sen in, in I think the 1970s, looking at, at subtle issues with um, using behavior as the, the standard for preference. I, I won't get into those details uh, here. Um, what I will say is that uh, something that I've never seen addressed very well is that 
if you are trying to uh, align an AI system with the um, uh, preferences of the entire human society as opposed to just one single individual. And it's certainly the case that there is, there are um, uh, uh, publications out there that talk about the whole society and not just one, one person. Um, uh, that there are certain decisions that need to be made about how you, essentially how you define human society uh, in these terms. And this gets into, um, uh, it's basically based on the fact that humans don't always agree with each other. Like we don't all have the same preferences. And so how do you um, resolve those sorts of disagreements? And, uh, and this is in um, uh, uh, basically uh, ideas in the, the research field called um, social choice theory. And which is essentially how do you form an aggregate preference on what should be done based on uh, some representation of what the individual preferences of members of society are. And there are three questions here. And this is something that um, some other research that, that we've published uh, uh, articulates. Uh, first, who counts? Who, who fits within the definition of society? Uh, you know, in democracies, it's whoever the voting age public is within that that country or that state or city or whatever. Uh, those are the people who are eligible to vote, maybe with some exceptions like felons. People in jail might not have the, the right to vote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, handling non-humans is always difficult and handling future humans is always difficult because, like, how do you know what their preferences are? Uh, they can't show up to vote in our elections or, or anything like that. So that's always difficult. Uh, then second, how do you measure what people's preferences are? So in a democracy, we vote. Uh, there's a sense in which a, um, uh, an open market economy is another way of uh, aggregating preferences where uh, we vote, quote unquote, by our, our uh, uh, economic decisions by what we purchase, what jobs we take, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's another way of measuring what people prefer. It's what they spend money on or what they're willing to accept money for. Um, there's other ways of doing it too, and they can point in different directions. There can also be a lot at stake with how we decide. Uh, behavior is another, another example of how to, um, how to determine what preferences people have. Uh, and then the third one is how do you aggregate individual preferences to form a group preference? So is it something like one person, one vote, or is it, uh, do you try to account for how strong people's preferences are? So like a market economy, uh, people have a stronger, can indicate a stronger preference by being willing to spend more money on it. That's tricky though, because some people just have more money and so their preferences may get weighted more. Uh, how you how you handle all those sorts of things? Do you have to deal with things like um, in in American politics we have gerrymandering, right? This is actually happening right now. Uh, there's probably work on gerrymandering going on as we speak because it's uh, you know it's uh, 2021, and so we just did the census and now we got to make the new maps and probably some of them are going to be gerrymandered, um, and that can. That sort of thing can also heavily affect the the outcome, as we know all too well from from following American politics and probably politics in other countries as well. Um, these are all things that have to be decided up front. You can't ask society for its aggregate opinion on how to define what society's aggregate opinion is. That's that's circular, and. Uh, I have not seen good discussion on how that should be set up within AI systems and, and how to operationalize it. Like if you think that members of future generations or non-humans should have their preferences accounted for, how do you do it? How do you actually implement that? I can say that in the, um, the, the general kind of moral theory literature, they talk about using proxy votes and, and things of that sort. Um, I would be interested in seeing more exploration of those sorts of ideas within the, um, the, the AI ethics field.
Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, really complicated question. Um, uh, okay, so another question um, in the chat. Uh, you mentioned concerns for non-human animals, uh, but have you also researched suffering of the AIs themselves? Uh, yes, definitely. So we have not researched the you know, kind of, I guess, cognitive science side of it, which is like, under what conditions would an AI have um, a positive or negative uh, experiences, pleasure, pain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I don't have anything particularly uh, uh, intelligent to say on that. I know other people have looked into this. It's a, a really fascinating question overall. Um, what I can say is that our more general work on the topic has specifically included that side of things. And this is why we have generally phrased our work in terms of say non-humans as a general category, as opposed to in terms of like animal welfare or something like that. And that's to account for the, the possibility that it could be more than just non-human animals that, that could matter in, in this sort of context. Um, another question, um, which areas in AI governance do you consider most pressing and what are potential paths into these? And I'm, I'm guessing uh, into career paths. What are the, um, uh, say, the question was, what are the most- um, Most pressing the areas for, in AI governance and paths And then was it paths, paths for like getting involved in it? Um, yeah. I'm um, maybe, uh, yeah, as like sort of getting involved on the side or as um, career, mm -hmm. uh, potential career. Path. Yeah, yeah. I, I can give a little plug. Um, let me just pull it up real quick. I'll, I'll put it into the chat window. Let me see if this will work. Uh, looks like it will. So the link I just shared is for GCRI's advising and collaboration program, at least the, the current edition of it that's, that's open this year. It, it, it went up in May 2021, a few months ago, but the program itself is, is still active. Um, and the, uh, uh, what we do with this program is basically field inquiries from people who are interested in getting involved in really any topic related to global catastrophic risk. Um, there's some emphasis on these AI governance topics because that's been uh, uh, a major focus for us recently, but it's, uh, we talk to people with a, a, a wide, wide mix of, of interest in global catastrophic risk. And we talk to people at all career points from students to senior scholars and professionals and um, uh, give them uh, uh, you know, personalized uh, uh, feedback on how they can pursue more work on this, connect them with other people in our network, occasionally collaborate with them on projects where there seems like a good fit. Uh, we've gotten a number of, of um, active collaborators through this program. And so for people who are thinking about getting more involved in this, feel free to, to go on to that, that, um, that web page and, and uh, reach out to us through that. It's, um, it, it doesn't really involve a, a major time commitment or anything. It can be as simple as like, maybe we'll have a, a phone call sometime or something like that. Um, and um, so that's, that's a simple one. Now the question of what are the most pressing areas? It's a tough question to answer in a sense because there's so many pressing things in, in so many different directions. Uh, when I'm providing people with advice on how to get involved, the advice tends to be heavily personalized uh, based on it's basically like what background does that person have and how can we leverage that background as much as possible for how they get involved, noting that there is a really wide range of backgrounds that are relevant. And the more you can uh, leverage your backgrounds, the more you're getting in in a more advanced capacity as opposed to a more more entry level and introductory capacity. And that's that's always um, that's always a, a plus too. Um, I, mean, I, I could reiterate what I said before about how I see a lot of value in 
having more people going into corporate governance as opposed to uh, public policy. That may be of particular interest for people based in New York City because there are corporations in New York City, uh, <laughs> to say the very least, and um, versus like people who live in Washington may have better uh, opportunities in uh, related to public policy. There are some uh, policy related opportunities in, in New York City, especially tied to the United Nations. Um, there's um, there's even what's the name of that? There's a, a think tank tied to the UN that that has done some some good work on AI. It's a good group. I'm blanking on their name. Um, uh, there, uh, bottom line, there is a little bit going on on the policy side in, in New York, but more of that's down in, in Washington. Uh, but still, the corporate governance, I think, is is a, a really high value direction to get into. And I might encourage people, if they have the, the option, to look in that direction um, instead of focusing on the public policy. So you really can't go wrong in, in either direction. And um, there can also be uh, good opportunities at the intersection of them or for more general things uh, like the sorts of research projects that we do. Like I work on both public policy and corporate governance and a few other things. And um, you know, I can do that because uh, within GCI, we have that sort of flexibility. Um, but yeah, the, um, there, there really isn't a, a bad answer to that question. I think a lot of it just comes down to what seems to make the most sense given somebody's background and their their career interests, um, the sorts of roles that they see themselves as being good at, or what would help them you know, uh, take the next step for their career professionally, help them learn, help them you know bolster their resume, connect with more people, all of that stuff, all of those you know, the, the normal uh, uh, career development considerations, I think, um, factor heavily into this. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks for talking more about that. And uh, could you just clarify again for the um, call for advices, um, is there's no deadline on that? Um, you just take them all year round? No. Uh, yeah, there's no deadline. Uh, at some point, we will probably wind down the current iteration of this program. Uh, we have not yet started to, to wind it down, and uh, we will probably just do another one again next year and the year after that and the year after that. So um, there isn't really a, a bad time to, to reach out to us um, uh, on, on these things. Awesome. Uh, all right. Yeah. So anyone interested in getting involved? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, look, uh, look at that link and um, make sure to reach out. Um, all right. So I think final audience question. Um, what is your view of how initial governance of AI is going? Um, for example, AI currently makes quality of life decisions in a lot of different industries, um, for example, prisons, insurance and healthcare. Um, and there's been a call to add more interpretability into AI decision making. Um, do you think policymakers understand and want to mitigate those risks right now? Um, and uh, yeah, are they thinking about greater risks in the future as they transition to higher power AI? Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, so the first thing that, that I can say is that AI policy making as it exists right now is heavily focused on these issues that are relevant for the, the near-term AI, the AI systems that we already have and that are that we are likely to have within a small number of years, uh, deep learning, et cetera. Uh, and so issues like the interpretability and explainability and uh, algorithmic bias, things of that sort, these really are at the forefront of AI policy making uh, as it exists right now, that these more longer term high power sorts of scenarios, yeah, sure, a lot of people who work in AI policy or have heard of them. Uh, you know, these are ideas that have gotten a lot of attention within the AI space over the, uh, over the years. Um, so it's, it's not like the, these ideas aren't out there but they tend not to get uh, as much focus 
for uh, maybe for a few reasons. One is that they are seen as being more long-term issues. And I think in fact, they probably are actually more long, long-term issues. And policymaking often has more of an orientation towards uh, more near-term issues, not always, but, but often has more of an orientation toward more, more near-term issues. That's one factor. Uh, the other factor is that uh, the, uh, the, the long-term high power AI sorts of um, uh, that, that side of things, maybe not entirely ready for, uh, excuse me, much, much policy making at this time in that there isn't much in the way of specific policy actions that make sense for, for governments to be taking now that are only relevant for these longer term AI scenarios. Uh, a lot of what we want for the long term AI also makes sense for the near term AI. Like we want it to be safe. We want it to uh, have a high ethical standard. We want policy making to be well informed by uh, how the technology actually works. Uh, these are all things that apply to, to near-term AI as well. And so to a large extent, the uh, policy outreach that, that we might be doing and maybe some of our, our colleagues at other organizations are also doing uh, don't really uh, dive into the, these more extreme long-term scenarios because uh, you know, governments are, are mainly focused on the near-term scenarios. Anyway, that's what they care about. It's important to, to you know, uh, address what people care about, um, especially if you want them to do something. And to the distinction in a lot of cases doesn't really matter for, for policy making. In some cases, maybe it does matter, but to a large extent, we can push for good, uh, for policy that is good for long-term AI by expressing it in terms of near-term AI, such that the, the distinction between the two isn't, isn't, uh, really isn't crucial. Um, Yeah, uh, that sounds pretty promising, I guess, uh, uh, at least, um, yeah, for making sure policy continues to go in a positive direction. Um, awesome. So, uh, yeah, I think we're close to wrapping up. My final question was just going to be, um, if you could tell us like a little bit more about um, exactly what uh, you guys do at GCRI. Um, on these issues, like obviously, uh, I know you you give presentations uh, like this, uh, and you uh, yeah. doing this research, um, putting out papers. Um, how else do you kind of try and get, um, yeah, uh, AI researchers yeah. thinking about these issues? Um, so, so yeah, we we do research, we publish papers. That's that's certainly a, a big part of what we do. Um, probably more so than a lot of think tanks because the topics that we work on tend to be more uncertain and have more uncharted territory, if you will, than, than maybe most, uh, most issues that think tanks work on because it's more future oriented. We're looking at more extreme scenarios that don't have as much precedent and, and so on. Uh, uh, so in addition to giving presentations like this, we also um, do outreach to other people who have a role to play on these issues. That includes outreach to governments, that includes outreach to, to private industry, um, and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then we also do a lot of community building and this um, advising collaboration program that's, that's really at the heart of that by uh, helping more people get involved, bringing people together with each other, uh, like people who didn't know that they both work on roughly the same topic and would totally benefit from from being in touch with each other, uh, things of that sort, helping, even helping um, different organizations uh, uh, find ways to collaborate with each other and, and facilitate that sort of interaction. That's, that's also a, a big part of what we do. Uh, we are you know, a, a small independent nonprofit organization that works on a really large uh, issue area because it's not just AI, it's also nuclear weapons and climate change and pandemics and so on and so forth. Um, and so we recognize that these issues are not just going to be addressed by a 
small independent nonprofit working on our own. And so we um, uh, uh, are very active in, in helping um, ha helping facilitate a, a much broader uh, uh, space of people and organizations working on working on these issues. Awesome. Um, yeah. Um, well, again, uh, thank you so much, Seth, um, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now.